Can we all see that? Yep. Cool. Okay. Thank you, Kip. As I said, uh, my name's Andrew Clark. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of the club uh, here at the Canberra Racing Club. Uh, we, we presented to you previously in uh, earlier this year through the March and, and February region as we discussed our, our plans for the redevelopment here at Thoroughbred Park. Uh, we've been out and about in the community and we're, I'm here tonight to talk you through a, a further update as to where we're at after we've heard initial views prior to submitting our territory plan variation. Um, I'll, I'll go through the project progress as we, as we have uh, achieved in the first half of this year. Uh, and Kip will take you through the process and I'm more than happy to answer any questions that people may have at the end. Um, as I mentioned, uh, we're, we're looking to pursue a territory plan variation of, of thoroughbred, thoroughbred Park here in Lyon. Um, we, we want to uh, maintain the uses and zoning for, our, for Thoroughbred Park as we are uh, to improve our facilities, but, but look to uh, make better use of our underutilised land uh, for the remainder of the site. It's quite a large site and we've done analysis of our present site and feel we could use it in a better way to, to better suit the community. Um, so I'll take you through the next steps in that process that we've been through. Um, through the process, we've, we've obviously learned from what other clubs throughout Australia have done. Uh, on the left of the screen there is a, is a picture of Eagle Farm in Brisbane. As you can see, they've moved their stabling to the infield. Uh, infield, infield areas in racehorses are generally are large, vast spaces of land uh, that have minimal use for other options. So we're, we're following a similar approach to Eagle Farm and Brisbane and looking to move our, our present stabling, which is along Randwick Road, into the infield of here at Thoroughbred Park, that, that making better use of the land and freeing up the existing stable sites. Move on, similar to Mooney Valley. Mooney Valley have looked to, uh, are going through a process similar to ours. They're, they're not as far along the way as what Eagle Farm are, uh, but they're looking to totally redesign their entire course build new grandstands and totally regenerate what they're doing. With our grandstands and facilities, we're looking for more of a redevelopment rather than a, a complete new stand approach. So since, since our, our last community consultation in February, our team have been busy going through a number of reports and talking to all, all the different uh, neighbours that we've got to our precinct, talking to the community. And, and I've also been busy doing a number of uh, media uh, interviews, be it on, on through the newspapers, the Riot Act or the radio, uh, to get word of, out about what we're trying to do, um, to get feedback from the community. We've spoken to the Gungala Community Council, we've spoken to yourselves, and we're back here again tonight to hear any further feedback. Uh, we want to get as much feedback from the community so we can in, end up delivering the best result possible for the community. Um, this is, has a variety of different studies that we've done. Um, they've been quite extensive, uh, traffic and transport. Noise no, noise is one that we'll, we'll touch on later that we've, we've taken quite seriously as we've heard the community's views on, on particularly EPIC and, and any impact of any development here would have. But there's been a vast array of uh, reports uh, that I'll, I'll hand over to Kip for him to go through in greater detail. Thanks, Andrew. Um, just check to make sure you can hear me okay. Yes, thanks. All right, cool. So, um, yeah, this, this little diagram shows the, the sort of a summary of the site reports or site investigations that have been undertaken. Um, and if we flick to the next slide, it has a very brief sort of summary of the outcomes um, that, we've, that we've got from them. Um, and so in, in very, very brief terms, the um, ecological and cultural heritage assessments have um, identified that really the site has been um, heavily used and um, in the past and the amount of disturbance on site has, has meant that there's not much in the way of, sort of ecological or cultural heritage remaining. Um, the infrastructure assessment that's been undertaken has demonstrated that the um, sort of Engineering infrastructure that's in the in the area is sufficient to support the, the type of development that's being contemplated. <clears throat> the hydrology and stormwater um, is one of the assessments which has um, 
identified some work that needs to be done to make sure that it gets um, the site is appropriately designed, um, particularly in relation to the Sullivan's Creek um, channel on the sort of southeastern side of the site, because in some of the future um, sort of high climate change flood scenario events, um, the channel that's there now will overtop a little bit, um, but because the site slopes up further from the channel, it's not a big issue for our site, but it is something that we need to be conscious of. Um, so that, that there'll be sort of minimum minimum um, floor levels for some of the um, some of the areas on the site that would be required. The traffic and transport side of things, um, the um, base case sort of traffic assessment has been undertaken. Um, we're working very closely with TCCS on um, the sort of appropriate approach to the um, future scenarios for traffic because. Um, it's actually a, it's a challenging time to be projecting forwards with traffic assessments at the moment. Um, I sat through a presentation the other night that told us that um, some, some of Canberra roads are currently, um, the traffic through COVID dropped to 40% of normal traffic, but it's, some of them are now 20% above what they were pre-COVID because the uptake of public transport has dropped off so much. Um, and so then predicting where things are going to go into the future is actually quite open-ended. Um, but obviously the expectation is that the light rail services this site very, very well. Um, it's a very good location to be um, encouraging low car dependency. Um, and so, um, yeah, we'll be taking those sorts of things into account when we're um, projecting the future traffic scenarios. Um, and obviously it's also, uh, as a site, um, it has fantastic opportunities to be connected to the active travel network, um, particularly with the, um, the rezoning on the Uani site mandating an active travel pathway along the Sullivan's Creek through Uani, um, and the city and gateway strategy um, providing for that active travel route to continue along Sullivan's Creek past our site. Um, and so we've been in conversations with um, Canberra Winery site who are also um, advocating for rezoning to make sure that we provide a regional active travel network that provides connectivity to the light rail stops as well as um, straight down into the city. Um, in terms of noise, light and odour, um, noise is also one of the subjects which we um, are having to make sure we get that particularly right. The um, our noise consultant has looked at the noise that the thoroughbred park activities generate typically um, on event days, et cetera. Um, and they've identified that the noisiest element from thoroughbred park is really the PA system, which is pretty much an old fashioned PA system, which just blasts noise out, sort of outlays. Um, and so that's actually a relatively easy um, thing that thoroughbred park can fix. And I, I think they're actually gonna do that um, irrespective of the rezoning proposal. Um, uh, but we're also very conscious that um, being next door neighbours to EPIC, um, we don't want to be introducing a, or creating a situation where future development on this site curtails the, um, the values that EPIC brings to the community and um, makes it harder for EPIC to do their business. Um, and so we're looking at um, planning solutions which um, create a site which uh, minimises its sensitivity to noise. Um, light and odour are not ones where we've, um, so we're not a, um, it's not a nighttime track. Um, we're not going to be um, enormous generators of light. Odour, um, there were some community questions around um, the smell of the um, equestrian facilities and stabling facilities. And that's one where um, Canberra Racing Club have been actually talking to some of the other clubs that have done these um, redevelopments to understand how they are controlling the odour and it really just comes down to a proactive management regime um, that, that um, collects and gets rid of the horse poo on an um, appropriate basis. Um, and site contamination, um, the um, investigations have not found any constraints to redevelopment in relation to site contamination. Um, so just stepping back, um, we are uh, Obviously, we spoke to you guys in February this year, and we did a, a, a range of other, um, provided a range of other 
um, opportunities for the community to learn about that. Andrew spoke about this a little bit already um, with attending the council meetings and providing drop-in sessions and online sessions. And, um, and the website has been available for people to ask questions. And um, so, yeah, there's, a, there's an ongoing online presence um, if people want to um, contact us for more information um, uh, outside of these sessions as well. Um, and we're doing a, a similar round of consultation now where we're talking to people about what we've learned with the studies that have been undertaken. Um, and so some of the key questions that were asked about the, um, the project the first time around, um, I've kind of answered a couple of these already, but just in relation to car parking, particularly on event days, um, that is catered for within the sort of concept plan. There's an overflow parking space within the um, within the boundary of the track. Um, the question about horse welfare, it's very much at the forefront of the um, ambitions for the project to um, improve the horse welfare on site through vastly improved stabling and, and facilities. Um, questions around water contamination with stabling in Sullivan's Creek, uh, um, sort of um, not, de not, in, not contemplated in a huge amount of detail at this stage in the process, because this is very much a sort of concept designing to support um, a rezoning process, but we're very, very confident and the preliminary engineering advice is that we can do on-site um, stormwater management and um, water management um, that will retain water on site that the, um, the club can actually use as well. They're a reasonable user of water. Um, so there's opportunities for that to be a, a plus plus. Um, the flood risk in hydrology, uh, I've already sort of talked about that. Um, and, and that's led to a couple of changes in the concept plan compared to what we showed you in February, because the location of some of the um, sort of concept, concept stormwater ponds, et cetera, has been moved um, to make sure that the hydrology will work better. Um, and the question about um, impacting on future events, um, we're confident that development on the site won't impact on the events of Canberra Racing. Um, and we're also confident that we can do it in a way that it doesn't um, negatively impact on Epic's ability to run their business. Um, we're, we're still in conversation with them about some of the finer details around that, um, but it's likely to include um, some additional planning controls in the precinct code to manage the sensitivity um, to uh, noise on the site. Um, and one of the other comments that we got from the uh, first round of consultation was along the lines of well, it's actually a really good spot for urban infill. So why don't we do the whole site and get rid of the horse racetrack? Um, but obviously um, Canberra Racing Club, uh, their, um, their business is being a horse racing club and it's their land. Um, and so their interest is in uh, maintaining their um, primary uh, reason to exist, um, but taking the opportunity to provide some urban infill around the outside. Um, so this is uh, the updated precinct plan, which um, is really quite similar to the precinct plan um, that was underpinning or was um, presented in February. The um, couple of changes really just relate to um, access arrangements along Randwick Road, along the sort of top side of the page. Um, this, the plan is not quite north up the page for those who are cartographers, um, apologies for that, um, but it fits better onto a sheet of paper in this orientation. Um, and then some of the, the sort of stormwater management ponds, there's a, um, the pond right down in the sort of, uh, what is this southern or southeastern corner of the site, is really it's at a lower, lower point in the site and would need to be down there to best manage the stormwater from the sort of newly urbanised area. Um, yeah, so it's pretty much, uh, it's, so it's, it's fundamentally a similar plan to what you saw in February. Um, and we really, um, we don't feel like we got comments from the community that um, warranted us making wholesale changes to it. Um, yeah, and so if I step on, this is this is a sort of proposed zoning plan, which is um, different to what we presented in February. Um, in February, we presented um, definitely the commercial mixed use opportunity up at the sort of Flemington Road end, 
um, and maintaining the existing zoning over the thoroughbred park part of the site. Um, but we were discussing more of a, um, a residential zoning for the southern part of the site, but we feel that having had more conversations around what the site um, needs to be and wants to be um, in terms of a precinct which is um, um, active and um, providing opportunities for um, sort of possibly equestrian related business opportunities, but also in the modern world of um, living and working in um, from home or in co-working spaces immediately adjacent to your house or um, those sorts of, there's, there's a bunch of reasons. And also um, from a managing expectations point of view, living in a mixed use commercial zone also manages people's expectations in relation to activity and noise around themselves. Um, we, we are thinking that the CZ5 is probably a, the most appropriate zone to be suggesting for that sort of southern area as well. Um, but noting when we suggest that, um, that that would come with some controls in the precinct code to make sure that it doesn't um, become what we don't want it to be, which is something which um, is outside of the kind of the retail hierarchy. We don't want to be trying to build a group centre in here and sort of messing up what's, um, uh, what's sort of established in urban Canberra. So, um, so similar to, I, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm assuming that people have um, read the Ioani draft plan variation, um, which contains um, a proposal to make the Ioani a CZ5 site, but with particular controls on the sort of minimum and maximum commercial spaces to, to provide for amenity for the residents, but not turn it into something which is beyond reasonable for the location. Um, so then very, just very quickly talking about the process, um, we're doing our second round of consultation, um, wanting feedback as we go. Um, we're very close to wrapping up a planning study, which we will give to the ACT government so that then the ACT government can um, undertake their, their um, process of drafting a territory plan variation and taking it through those steps. Um, this is the kind of process overview. In February, when we spoke to you, um, our little red dot was at the start of the site investigation and planning reports. It's, we're now at the end of that, but we're just making sure that it's clear that the, um, the territory plan process has a couple of years to run um, before a development phase um, will commence. And so there's, um, there's plenty of time for um, uh, an opportunity for people to be involved in it, going through that territory plan variation process as well. Um, and so, yeah, as, as we've said, we've, we've got a, a little bit of um, detail to complete in our um, conversations with EPIC and TCCS around noise and traffic. Um, we'll be, um, I just spotted the typo there, but it's not May 2012. Um, the, um, and then we'll be putting our draft planning report together and giving that to the Territory to consider from there on. Um, and I think that that's probably time for me to stop, I, and, well, to stop talking um, and ask if anybody has any questions. Um, I might, I'll skip back to that page if that's what people would prefer me to have on the screen while we're answering questions. I'll, I'll start off with a question if nobody else has any. Mm -hmm. uh, the ecological, um, in one of the early slides, I think you said there are no ecological constraints. Um, but the grasslands reserve, the Christ grasslands reserve, obviously are immediately adjacent and so are a significant neighbor to your, I'm trying to think to the west, is that right? Yeah, it's sort of northwest. Yeah. So, um, I mean, as great grasslands, they're obviously going to have a lot of insects. And so, light spillage from urban development across the road will mean. All sorts of insects, including moths, um, would be attracted, you'd expect, at night from mm -hmm. buildings and streetlights. Um, so I was curious um, what uh, consideration has been given to the impact that that has on the birds um, and, you know, other small um, 
reptiles, that sort of thing. Um, and then, of course, Sullivan's Creek. So the um, likelihood with um, introducing more hard surfaces, impermeable surfaces in the vicinity of Sullivan's Creek, of course, is that you have more runoff and um, significantly more runoff and therefore the downstream impacts and um, potential for flooding in Lynham, O'Connor, Turner, Acton, the ANU um, are all obviously going to be of concern to other um, yeah, other communities um, and would obviously have an ecological impact. So anyway, I'd like to hear what you have to say about those. So the the first one, which is kind of the light spill interface across the road to the grasslands, um, I, I'd, I'd say we haven't sort of done a specific piece on it yet, um, but it's like um, this at this stage where really it's a concept design, there's quite a large um, treed road reserve between us and the, um, the grasslands, but there's also quite a wide buffer, um, which is a power line um, easement between us and the road as well. So there's there's a reasonable distance across there. Um, I think um, maybe maybe what we should do is get our ecologist to provide us some specific, a little bit of specific advice about the likely um, the likely impact of light spill from sort of an urbanised development along that front. There's um, obviously there's there is existing development on the site now, so there is some lighting there. Um, but it's probably not to the same scale that it would be into the future. So I think that's probably a reasonable question that we should make sure that we provide an answer to in our um, planning study. In terms of the Sullivan's Creek, I think that that's probably an easier one for me to answer straight off because um, the, the water sensitive urban design codes um, that are now you know, recently updated in the territory plan um, do provide us pretty strong guidance for um, on-site um, capture, treatment, reuse, um, and et cetera, from the increased, increased permeable areas that would be being generated by this. And so the, um, our engineers have been designing um, retention ponds within the site to um, manage the increased runoff from the development. Um, and also just sort of as a, as a separate piece, um, the ACT government is, is sort of in parallel with our project undertaking a remodeling of the Sullivan's Creek catchment to take into consideration um, their plans upstream and downstream. Um, so the, um, we're, obviously we're only a relatively small part of the overall catchment, um, but we are, we've been working quite closely with um, the appropriate people within EPSDD to make sure that um, we can fit in with them. So there's there's quite a um, quite a detailed piece of hydrological work that's being done to um, under, understand the, the flooding risks on this site, but also then how we um, manage our contribution to those risks going forward. Thanks, Kim. I just have a, a, a query too, to keep um, segueing from Jane's concerns about mm -hmm. ecology. Um, I was wondering, even though you're again saying that there's no um, intrinsic ecological issue here, one mm -hmm. of the intrinsic ecological issues in all urban planning is making sure there are corridors to encourage connectivity with the grasslands being so close by. I was just wondering in the later landscape planning, you could consider what species would actually be beneficial mm -hmm. to connectivity and incorporate that so that, in fact, the grasslands can uh, provide a continual route for plants and uh, for mm -hmm. insects and birds, etc. I think that would be a useful thing to enhance the site mm -hmm. logically. Yep, I, I agree. Um, I think the, the level of detail that underpins a rezoning decision is possibly not going to go to that level. But, but also, um, again, in parallel with the work that we're doing here, um, the policy um, around living infrastructure and 
the Territory Plan Review Project, which I know has, um, has included quite a substantial piece on climate-wise, um, future development, et cetera, will mean that um, this, this project in a, in, you know, in a couple of years' time, hopefully, fingers crossed, when the Territory Plan is varied, um, and the Thoroughbred Park are allowed to um, pursue their development aspirations. Um, it will be in an, in an environment with probably stronger environmental controls than the development that you're seeing today. Good, thank you. <laughs> Question um, about Sullivan's Creek. Um, I noticed from your um, plan of the, the various zonings, the, the open space strip that you allowed for Sullivan's Creek seems very narrow. I'm just wondering what sort of um, width are we talking about? Because uh, I'm from Lynham and um, we've been lobbying for some time to try and get an extension of the Sullivan's Creek bike path um, mm -hmm. through Yuwani, then up up along here between you and, and the, the um, Canberra winery. And it, yeah. it just didn't look like a very wide strip you had there. It looked like it was just enough for the, the stormwater channel and not much else. It'd be good to make that a bit wider so you can actually allow um, mm -hmm. for people to, to move up there. So, so well, backwards and forwards. Yeah. So what what we've been showing is um, from the thoroughbred parks point of view, um, they are advocating for rezoning within the land that they own, which on the screen is pretty much um, the red dotted line. Um, but we're we're being a little bit cheeky and going outside that land um, and identifying that we think that Sullivan's Creek actually should be being rezoned in parallel as urban open space, because at the moment it's just zoned Broadacre, which is just a historical um, thing for the area. So, so what we're saying is that if you're going to rezone Canberra as an urban environment, Thoroughbred Park as an urban environment, the, the creek line in between should be urban open space too. Um, and we are showing that urban open space boundary um, to correspond with the block boundary that the creek currently exists within. Um, I'm not off the top of my head, I'm actually, I can't tell you how wide it is, but it's the, it's the concrete channel plus a few metres on either side. Um, and, um, but we're also, as part, of our, um, as part of our planning study, in the same way that Yuani um, in there, in the precinct code for Yuani, it, it says that they have to deliver a, um, a, a proper sort of um, main community route standard active travel pathway along the creek. Um, we're saying that that requirement um, should continue up Sullivan's Creek um, adjacent to this, you know, through this area as well, which is, which is in the, the city and gateway strategy identifies it as something that should be happening. Um, and we've been talking to, the, the challenge that we've got is actually, um, we're talking to Colin Maher and the, um, in the active travel office, it's um, connecting the two links um, under or over or around the Barton Highway. Um, but so, because there's not really a, a readily available underpass at that point. And so um, we're trying to make sure that it gets, it gets worked out in, sort of in, the, in, the, in the right context, whether it ends up um, going down to the traffic lights or whether there's a long-term plan for a grade separated crossing so that you can go because once you get, um, and also at the northern end of our side as well, further um, at the sort of Flemington Road, Randwick Road end, um, there's also a bit of discontinuity in the active travel network, um, but you don't have to go very far just past Epic and you're getting onto another really high quality path that gets you all the way up into Gungahlin. So um, with, a, with a proper link through this area, um, it would provide a really good um, sort of alternate Gungahlin Mitchell um, Dixon sort of city um, cycleway. Um, continuing, if you don't mind, from the previous question that uh, stole some of my thunder about it. <laughs> um, but um, again, in line with uh, uh, public use and thing, and you indicated that you guys would like to actually see it as a bit more of a public space. Um, how much of uh, open for the public you see the area and considering the fact that the stable and everything going to be uh, going to be internal to the race course including the mm -hmm. car park which means that in theory it should be 
have some uh, ability to for pedestrian cyclist and the like to cross through the site to for a shortcut to a as you uh, noted the Barton Highway and to be away from a major arterial way is there any thought put around that or it's still going to be a kind of thing fence zone for the residential or businesses that are going to be there and set to so the um the the expectation that andrew might want to correct me if i get this wrong but the, my expectation is that thoroughbred park needs to be a fenced facility um so we can't just have people walking through across the race course um and those sorts of areas partly because they run ticketed events but also partly because um raw horses that are training don't want people walking across the track sort of thing so um, we certainly want to make sure that there is a public thoroughfare either in or immediately adjacent to the site that follows the Sullivan's Creek in a sort of a, um, a it's, on this picture it's um, sort of east-west but it's really more a sort of north-south north orientation but then um, in the sort of urban development area to the south of the race course um, the likelihood is that there will be um, separate blocks and, and public streets um, mm. that would provide opportunities for people to come through the site. Um, and those, those streets would be um, pretty much like local access streets, um, providing for good um, active travel connectivity. And also, importantly, um, there's a um, tram stop down at the Phillip Avenue um, point on Federal Highway. And so um, certainly um, there's conversations that are ongoing to ensure that there's active travel connectivity from Phillip Avenue through to that um, Sullivan's Creek path. That would mean that people can come through that and through to get to our site as well. Um, yeah, so I'd just probably add slightly to that, Kip, that you're right, areas two, three, four and five there on your screen uh, would all be accessible to the public on a regular basis. Um, Kip, Kip's correct in that uh, we, we, our club does run ticketed events, but in saying that, we also run a number of functions and events for the community, uh, whereby the community regularly has access to our facilities, which on that map there is 1A. Um, to give you an idea, prior to COVID, uh, we would have 100,000 people uh, through the facility here at Thoroughbred Park on an annual basis. Um, and and uh, us proceeding on this redevelopment provides us the opportunity to reinvest back into those facilities that are enjoyed annually by those 100,000 uh, Canberrans and visitors to the Territory. Um, Ian Hubbard here. Um, I was just wondering, uh, and it might be answered in the business plan, um, was there alternative um, uses for, the, um, for areas um, three, four and five um, I think keep more more towards equestrian um, activities, like um, you know, if you envisage the um, the snow um, equestrian uh, park down at Maruya or mm -hmm. things like that, where interstate visitors bring their horses and have a you know a damn good horse time, which yeah. seems like a lot of Canberrans um, are equestrian mm -hmm. orientated and the areas available to them seem to be shrinking. So that's the first question. But then the second question is, does the business plan also um, have a target for um, what sort of return you're expecting and how many residences would be going to four, five, three, four and five? Um, so in terms of the use side of things, um, definitely um, at area two on the plan up here, um, is um, identified as a really good spot for um, an accommodation opportunity, um, you know, because it's between Thoroughbred Park and Epic. So um, some sort of hotel or, or equivalent would be a, a, a pretty obvious choice there. Um, but then also the, the, um, the reason, one of the reasons that we're, we've sort of changed from a residential zoning to a CZ5 zoning for areas three, four and five is that it does provide much greater flexibility um, in terms of future uses on the site. So um, the CZ5 really allows us to do almost anything except for sort of high intensity 
um, high intensity industrial type uses or high intensity retail. Um, and so there's, and, and the time frame for the project is also, um, you know, it's 10, 15 years into the future. And so um, the world may well have changed in that time frame. And so CZ5 provides us with the flexibility to pursue a um, more commercial accommodation or more um, even just sort of more commercial type uses or um, different housing typologies or um, there's you know the opportunity for an aged care or a um, you know, supportive housing options is there's, there's quite a wide range of um, possibilities there um, and it, just in terms of the overall return or yield um, the, there's a there's a number that's being used to sort of underpin some of the assessments which is around about 3,200 dwellings or 3,200 dwellings. Um, and that's that's kind of a, a notional yield attached to this plan because we have to have a number um, so that it we can assess potential traffic impacts or um, servicing and utility um, things. But obviously if with different land uses, um, we get different, um, different demands for some of those services and traffic impacts, et cetera. So um, the, the assessment is based on a number which is um, probably a, um, a, sort of a, a slightly aspirational number because then that covers um, covers things if um, if we end up with different uses, etc. So, yeah. So part of that question, and you know, maybe I I can have a look at the business plan, but is there is there an imperative on the, on the the part of the the racing club to get additional revenues? Um, to survive in a sense of, you know, basically you're a, you know, a um, not-for-profit in a sense, but, um, you know, has it come to the stage where you need to pull in an extra, you know, a couple of million each year to, to be, um, um, to break even? I would say the, the racing, the clubs similar to most all the golf clubs in Canberra and a lot of the other clubs where they're needing to diversify their revenue streams. Yeah, I'll, I'll probably touch on that. That's one yeah. of the into of the whole project is that we look to diversify our revenue to, to survive and strengthen our industry into the future. Our industry at the moment employs over 400 Canberrans and we need to foster the industry uh, so the employment uh, is continued and, and, and thrives into the future. Great. So I can get, if I look at the business plan, can I see that sort of requirement? You know, if you're looking for like over 10 to 15 years, you should be looking for revenues to come from this development being, you know, one or two million a year to help you, you know, achieve your goals. Yeah, so the, the business plan itself isn't a public document. Oh, okay, uh, cool. Um, but very, but, very disappointing. <laughs> or, uh, I'm not sure the uh, many clubs would, would make uh, th those sort of things as public documents. Um, but there are those four key things that we're, we're looking at, um, be that improve our facilities to give back to the community, improve equine welfare, uh, diversify our revenue stream, uh, and also create a vibrant precinct as well. So there's a number of different approaches that we're looking at with uh, those aspirational figures that, that Kip mentioned um, to underpin our, our future successes in the industry here in Canberra. Yeah, so the actual implementation pathway is still to be determined, like in terms of the, um, you know, sales or built to rent or, or all of those sorts of things. Um, we're really at this point in time. We're just going to get over the um, over the threshold of getting the rezoning um, approved. Mm. Yeah, it is just interesting how many of those um, sporting clubs um, are under pressure at the moment and do yes. require. You know, significant redevelopments on their um, on their property to survive or to maintain their prime function. So, mm -hmm. I just think that's the the economics and finance around that's um, um, pretty pretty interesting. I think, and mm -hmm. as you say, you're not alone. I think it's just about every sporting club in Canberra, whether it's football or anything, golf. You know, they're all under pressure to to be viable and not close down. So. Mm -hmm. Interesting to see those numbers. It is definitely a broader issue uh, with the um, sporting bodies here in the ACT. Uh, similarly, we're surrounded by New South Wales, which has got a thriving racing industry. 
So we need to adequately uh, compete with what's occurring uh, there as well. So it is an issue where we're, we're extremely we're extremely we're, we're profitable at the moment as a not for profit, uh, but we have future aspirations to to grow our grow our industry. So to do that, we, we need to do things like this that capitalises on our market value at least to make a better use of, of the land compared to when we were first uh, arrived here back in the early 1960s. Uh, the arrangement that we have in, in place now is vastly different to, to th those time frames. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Great. Thanks, um, Andrew and Kip. I think we'll have to move on at this point unless anyone else had some um, I have one, one quick okay. question. Sorry, yeah. I was just looking at the updated precinct plan, which looks very attractive. Um, there are four roads that it's showing that end um, very abruptly um, before the green buffer. Mm -hmm. What's to prevent that green buffer from becoming a further stage of urban development? The, the green buffer that you're talking about is the pony club between us and the Barton Highway. Is that what you're looking yep. at? That yeah. would be right. So that, that's, um, it's not our land um, and the, so it, it doesn't, um, it's not really up to us to make decisions about what goes on um, in that direction. Um, I think the roads, um, yeah, I, I think that would have to be something to, to ask um, the ACT government about what their future plans for that area might be. Okay. Great. Well, um, yeah. Thanks again, and um, I think we'll include a that um, picture of the map in the in the next newsletter as well. Um, yep. Yeah. That, that'd be great. If anyone has any additional comments, please feel free to contact me. Log on to our website and sign up, and, and we'll keep you uh, informed as we progress. Cheers. Cool. Thank you, everybody. I appreciate your time.